I have the great honor to present for the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts, Honoris Causa, Orville Shaggy Burrell. Agree. Come on. Uh, Orville Shaggy Burrell, your style, your voice, and your influence on reggae and the genre's growth in American pop culture cannot be overstated. You're recognized the world over for your success as a musician, your leadership and dedicated philanthropy through the Shaggy Makes a Difference Foundation has inspired peers and musical legends to join you in concert to raise funds for those in need. The Shaggy and Friends concerts have raised more than $100 million in equipment for the Bustamante Children's Hospital in Jamaica. For your accomplishments as a recording artist and your service to others, we honor you with the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts. By the authority vested in me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts and all rights and privileges pertaining to this degree I give to you. And in witness of this, I collegially give you this diploma. Uh. and a song to our graduates. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had my mask on so you couldn't see the grin from ear to ear while this was going on, man. It's it's incredible, I, 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 I really thank you. So, class of 2020. <laughs> Wagwan! <laughs> you always have a Jamaican in here somewhere, man. <laughs> Distinguished guests, uh, hold on, I need the glasses because I can't see them. <laughs> I got the cool glasses and then the reading glasses. <laughs> Distinguished guests, class of 2020, thank you all for having me. I've always wondered what it would be like to attend college. <laughs> kind of experience it a little bit today. What would the experience, the experience be I was never blessed with the opportunity. I couldn't afford it. I would have loved to have uh, gotten a college experience and receive a higher uh, education. See, I'm from a single parent family. I was raised by my mom and partly by my grandmother. Like most Jamaican inner city families, dads weren't always present. I'm from a small fishing village in the downtown area of Kingston called Raytown, a place made famous for the birth of the sound system any Jamaican or Caribbean people in here? <laughs> Y'all would know the significance of the sound system to dance hall and reggae culture. I've always had music in my blood, even though no one else in my family ever did music. So it wasn't surprising to me that music would be my path. After all, I was so passionate about it. And you know what they say, you can't excel at anything without passion. I love Toots and the Maytals, Jimmy Cliff, Bob Andy, Dennis Brown, and of course, of course, the great Bob Marley. I admire Supercat, any dancehall fans in here would know that. 
Josie Wales, Barrington Levy. These were my reggae and dancehall heroes. I remember one night going to a place called Skateland in Kingston. I watched an artist called Yellow Man. On that night, I caught the bug. Yellow Man was an albino guy who at the time was the reigning sensation in dancehall. I saw him spit a few lyrics and the crowd went wild. He walked out of the dance and the whole crowd walked out the dance. And I said to myself, damn, I want to be that guy. <laughs> My mother worked at the local newspaper, the Daily Cleaner, after which she uh, migrated to the United States and landed in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn in the house! <laughs> New York. <laughs> New York. Now, that was a culture shock. I was, in, I was introduced to cultures from Haiti, Trinidad, Panama, Barbados, Guyana, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. It was one big melting pot. And they all had one thing in common. They all loved reggae and dancehall music. Though reggae and dancehall was the main music of my country and had developed a large appeal and following within the New York diaspora, it wasn't mainstream. And it was starting to look like my dreams of a successful career in reggae and dancehall was pretty dismal. My mother grew frustrated of my efforts. We started to bump heads, and I knew at that point that I got to get out of her house. <laughs> so I decided to enlist in the military, the United States Marines. Thank you. I served in the Gulf War at Desert Storm, and funny enough, I joined the military so I could get the GI Bill. The GI Bill was a college fund offered to enlisted personnel. Uh, and to me, the military became my college. I felt like I belonged to something, um, somewhat of an institution. Every time someone came up to me and said, thank you for your service, I felt a sense of pride, accomplishment, as if I actually graduated or something, you know? <laughs> By the time I was finished with my tour of duty, my music career was well on the way. You see, I used to drive 18 hours from... Uh, uh, to and from, uh, from New York to Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina, every weekend just to do records in Brooklyn. I sometimes would drive in my uniform so that if I get pulled over by, for speeding by the state trooper, they'd give me a warning because most of them were all retired servicemen. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. All phones off. <laughs> After I was discharged, one of the songs I recorded while in my uniform, Old Carolina, shot all the way to the British chart and earned me my first number one, uh, my first number one spot with a million dollar contract at that from Virgin Records. Yeah. Ballin'! No. <laughs> at the time, no one in dance hall was getting that kind of money for their deals, so it was the first of its kind. I remember thinking to myself, hey, a million bucks. Even if I never got another hit, I got a million bucks. But little did I know that was the first of many firsts, shortly after I wrote a song called Mr. Bombastic. <laughs> this debuted at number one in the British chart. It was the first time in the history of dancehall or reggae uh, that a, a, a dancehall or reggae track would debut at the top of the charts, after which Virgin Record gave me another million. <laughs> I was like, mm, I could get used to this. <laughs> Mr. Bombastic peaked at number two, on the U.S. Billboard charts, while Summertime, another track, uh, made it to number three on the British charts. Another first for Dan Saul, having two songs, top five on the charts in two different continents at the same time. This was quite an accomplishment. Thank you. I went on to record Hot Shot, the, uh, the Hot Shot album, which became the first and only dancehall album, and the only, uh, the first and only number one dancehall album, and the only diamond selling album in dancehall history to date. <laughs> Both Angel and It Wasn't Me were number one records, uh, uh, and uh, they were at number one, they sold about they were at number one for record numbers of week and sold about 500,000. That's gold of the week. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty hot. <laughs> that's before streaming, by the way. Hard copies, baby. Uh, this at a time where Caribbean music wasn't even being played on, uh, on radio. 
You see, I realized early on that nothing showcased culture like stars and nothing shifts culture like superstars. Because the odds were against me as a Caribbean artist doing dancehall and reggae music, I knew I had to become not just a star, but a superstar. A star with superhero-like talent, personality, charisma, work ethic, and presence. I knew record labels weren't gonna invest money into a Caribbean act unless they produced numbers, sales. So I had to go 10 times harder, make music 10 times better and more infectious than any other genre while getting 10 times less sleep. All this to even have a fighting chance or a seat at the table. We sold huge numbers and opened the doors for the genre and gave the industry confidence in investing in Caribbean acts such as Sean Paul, Wayne Wanda, Elephant Man, to name a few. Not bad for an inner city kid from Kingston who didn't use his GI Bill. <laughs> but I had the mindset to go hard. I always say, I may not be the most talented, but no one will outwork me. So get ready. Saddle up, because it's going to be one hell of a ride. Hey, look at me. My journey still continues. I'm here at Browns University accepting an honorary degree from an Ivy League school. <laughs> Part of the class of 2020, baby. <laughs> so just so you know, that's life, and it only gets better. I didn't just go, uh, I didn't get to go to college, but I had an amazing journey. I traveled around the world. I've been to many cities, met many great people, sat with, with great leaders and politicians and royalty. I remember sitting at the table with the great Nelson Mandela and feeling like I just met the closest thing to an actual God. I remember his humility and how he made me feel like I was the only person in the room. I remember getting a call from Michael Jackson to perform at the Jackson 530 anniversary celebration in Madison Square Garden. And Michael saying to me, uh, did you write it wasn't me? <laughs> I say, yeah, that's my favorite song. Sound like something I would write. At that point, I was excited that he even knew my name or, you know, that, that was just crazy for me. I remember meeting the queen, sitting with the pope, and even having the distinguished honor of meeting the lead singer of the police. <laughs> One advice my brother Sting told me on giving this speech, he said, Shaggy, tell them about your journey. You told it to me and I was inspired. So my purpose to, here today is to inspire. And I do so by sharing my journey. We sometimes pull inspiration from the most unlikeliest people in situations. I remember meeting the great James Brown, who sat me down, uh, who, who gave me one of the most profound sit-downs ever that I've ever received. I was on tour in Antwerp, or Antwerp. Did I say that right, Martin? <laughs> and we were uh, on this tour with, it was me, Joe Cocker, James Brown, the Pointer Sisters, Cindy Lauper. I was the youngest guy on the whole thing. We were there for a whole month. And every single night I came out on stage, they'd bring a, stage, a, a chair to the side of the stage, and James Brown would sit down and do this. <laughs> every single, and he did it to no one else but me every night. So I always got away with calling him, hey, Godfather, and it was like, Jackie! While everybody walked by and said, how you do that? We have to call him Mr. Brown. <laughs> One day he kicked my door open. Didn't knock, kicked it open. My dressing room door. He walked in, there was a huge security guard behind him and he stood behind, me, behind the door. I seen James Brown, he said, sit down, I want to talk to you. At that point I, was, I thought I was gonna get a James Brown beat down. <laughs> security behind the door, James telling me to sit down. Think to myself, did I miss this perm up or something? I don't know what was up. <laughs> he says, sit down, I want to talk to you. Let me tell you something. I've seen them come and I've seen them go. I've been to your country. I roll it up and smoke it with Marley. You the truth. Let them see both sides of you. And you funny. Let me tell you something. They could take away your woman, your house, your car, your money. But it's one thing they'll never take from you. And that's your talent. Because that was given to you by high beam. He said, keep doing what you're doing. God bless you. And he walked out. <laughs> the thing that made that so profound for me is that I believed him. And every time I'm in a position where I'm down, 
I turn to my talent and I tap into it and I master it. And I'm always come up back on top. You should never stop dreaming or being inspired. I'm inspired by all these great people who have introduced, who have touched my life and have, and, uh, and have helped me to realize that life is a gift and a privilege. And we should always move with gratitude. And throughout its ups and downs, every day above ground is a good day. You see, we are all here for different reasons. And we all have different paths to take on our journey. From day one, when we were born, we take our first breath. Right? And on the day we pass, we take our last breath. So we have only a certain amount of breaths to take within our journey. So please remember to breathe. <laughs> I know we all like to say we're kings and queens, and maybe we are. But one thing for certain is that we are all servants. We're here to perform a service to mankind. Servants of God. We're all given the tool to perform our service, a talent. We're not here to achieve material things. After all, we can't take them with us. Our main purpose is to inspire and change people's lives. That's our true purpose. Every time I go on tour, there are 17 band members that come with me. That's 17 mortgages, 17 school fee, electric bills, car payments, all because I sing these songs. There are concessions, uh, the concession guys, the riggers, the security, the drivers, the janitors. They are all paying their bill because I decided to use my tool and serve. So when it's all said and done, one thing I maintain is gratitude. And I'm grateful that I was chosen to serve. And I look forward to your journey in hopes that one day we'll meet again and I'll be able to say to you guys, thank you for your service. Oh, by the way, since I know y'all missed y'all uh, great celebration during the uh, COVID, it's kind of sad to make you put masks on like you're reliving COVID. <laughs> but everybody will be outside for the class of 2022, but we're in here 2020 and we're going to turn up. I'm Mr. Lover Lover. Woo! It's the Lover Lover. Hey! Here we go, here we go, here we go. She call me Mr. Bombastic. Say me fantastic. Don't send on me box, she says I'm Mr. Row. Monty, say me fantastic. Is the party in here or what? Yo, Anna, where you at? Can I get some more microphone in here, please? You're my darling. 